Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. This program is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You could use our code, which is advices uh, at checkout. That'll give you some additional savings. Plus, it will uh, let them know that you support what we are doing here. Scott, good to talk to you, man. How you been? Likewise, buddy. Busy. Super duper busy, but good busy. Right on. There's a bunch of stuff I want. Oh, go ahead. We did the podcast two weeks ago, and then I, I did uh, eight po- four podcasts in eight days. You're kidding me. After so that. Yeah, you did. Well, the two that we were, we had, and then I did Ben Mikulski's, and then um, Carl Lenore had me back on Superhuman Radio. Oh, I didn't know that you were back on Superhuman. What did you talk about on Superhuman Radio? The book. You want to talk about the book again? Oh, no for, kidding. For the first time, yeah. Last time, I think I talked about, um, oh, the Megalin Receptor, SHBG, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. This time, you just... Yeah, uh, we talked about the book and bodybuilding and uh, the nature of the beast that is bodybuilding. That's cool. From a socio political psychological perspective, a little bit. Did he tell you anything about his eye while uh, while you were on with him? He brought it up. But I guess that's the a running bit of information. Yeah, I didn't know he had the patch off, and I hadn't. I didn't. I couldn't tell yeah. that it was going on just because of the clarity. And he he actually like looks way off to the side. Oh yeah. So so like I think that eye was kind of like the one that was furthest from me. Yeah. And then he and then like he literally started the show talking about his eye. I'm like, oh okay, yeah. So I guess it's getting better. I think he's he's out of the woods as far as the eye goes. Yeah. But he had said that he had scratched his cornea. He was told not to wear his contacts, but he did anyway to the Arnold when we saw him at the Arnold. Oh. And uh-huh. he had gotten an, an infection in his cornea, which basically blinded him. Thankfully, it was temporarily. He can. He said he could see mm-hmm. shapes now. And the last five days have been good. Um, he also said everybody told him that he he used to be wearing. He was wearing a patch, and he said people thought he should stay wearing the patch because it was like it added a layer of mystery to him. That's you know? what he said. Yeah, <laughs> that's the character. I got to listen yeah. to this one. So this. The, what what day was that? Uh, this was last week. A week ago. Oh, week ago. It comes out of It's on. Li- it's live on Facebook, and it's in the um, Superhuman Nation. Okay. Or a Facebook group. Okay. Which is what he calls himself now, I think. Nice. I'll have to yeah. check that one out. And I'll definitely look for the audio podcast on iTunes. Speaking of iTunes, um, VJ and I mentioned it last week on Bodybuilding Nerds Radio. I've been making posts everywhere I can. I've been answering tons of DMs. Um, Frank Vera just uh, uh, commented on our thread here, sit or on our show here, and he says, uh, Hey, Scott. Looks like all the episodes, uh, and he's speaking of Advices Radio from 17, 18, and 19, were deleted from the podcast app on iTunes. Is there another way to listen to them, uh, or will they be back on the app? So currently the situation is is that the website is down, and that's uh, that's where all the podcasts are stored at. You know, They're all on the server over at the Advices Radio page, and then through the RSS feed, you guys can view those uh, via iTunes and whatnot, any other any other uh, apps that you use. So while the website's down, those podcasts aren't going to be available, but they are still there. Worst case scenario, I have them all on backup. So I have them on a par- uh, portable hard drives. But that said, for the moment, uh, while the website is down, which has been about six days now, um, they are not available, unfortunately. So IT is working on it. I'm going to ask for an update today to see where we're at. Hopefully, it'll be back up soon. But listen, if they can't get it fixed, I'm just going to take this thing and I'll be the new IT guy. I'll uh, I'll just put it up if if they if they don't if they can't get it if this is not going to be a team effort anymore with with uh, you know the team that backs me up, then I'll have to do it on my own in some fashion. We'll go to SoundCloud. We'll get all the shows up. And until then, all the shows are still recording. All these programs are still going up. The place where you can still see them is over at YouTube. So for the time being, you can check them out at YouTube. All the video casts, exactly what Scott and I are doing right now. We've got a a, a polished, edited version of this where you actually see a clear-cut intro and outro. uh, And that'll be be up at uh, YouTube on Thursday. Um, and, uh, until then guys, I'm really sorry that it's not available on the audio format. I know 
I'm a big fan of audio podcasts personally. I prefer that over video. But, uh, you know, I, I think that the video is definitely better than nothing. And thank you. Also, one more thing. I want to say thank you to everybody who has been subscribing to the YouTube page because uh, we are, the numbers are growing over there. And it's pretty cool to see. I think that we're getting some new followers, people who didn't know about Advices Radio before. And uh, they're finding out about guys like uh, Scott Stevenson and the Swoley Trinity and uh, everything else going on. So anyway, that's that's my soapbox about what's going on there, Scott. Um, I love the the podcast you did with Ben Pakalski, by the way. Quick, quick question for you yeah. on podcasts. Yeah. Um, sometimes I go. I don't know if you know how to do this, but I go to the Wayback Machine, mm -hmm. the Internet Archive. Um, and I just looked like literally. I pulled up the um, Advices Radio page, and um, there is some stuff archived there, but not very much. I like went to go click on the latest. Uh, the latest episode there was from April. Okay. But when I click on it, it doesn't come up. Basically, it's it's empty. So maybe that's a, something worth doing is um, make it available on just as a, a backup, which I think would be for free on the Internet Archive on the Wayback Machine. Okay. I'll check that you know out. I mean? Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I, I find all sorts of cool. I've gone back like to Intense Muscle and found stuff. Yeah. You know, from way back when. It's very, very cool. So that anyway, is cool. I've yeah. used that before. I had a photo gallery website uh, years ago, you know, when I was in photography. And I've accessed that because that website's long gone now. And right. I've, I've gone back to see the different installations I had, you know, of that site. That is cool. I totally forgot about the Wayback Machine. Yeah, I go there. I go there I mean, probably once every three or four months. There's always something, you know, that's gone. Yeah. Um, like try to recreate someone's web page, something like that, like, like you were just saying. But um, it's actually kind of it's kind of cool. Like, it's like it's like a time machine. Yeah, you, know, you can go back and see how things once were. Professional muscles a fun one to go to too. Mm, yeah, you know, let's go back to you know 2004, something like that. Mm, pre Operation Raw Deal. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff, all that stuff. So anyway, yeah. um, yes, the Ben Pokolsky podcast that was fun. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I man, so my personal experience, I have these, these headphones, they're noise canceling and I plugged them into my, my phone and I cut my lawn and did all my yard work while I was listening to you and Ben I, talk. I the sound that. quality was so good because like, you guys recorded that in the same room, right? Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's on video on YouTube. Yeah, that was, that was pretty cool, man. I gotta, I gotta look at the YouTube then. Um, and you guys recorded that after you and Ben had trained legs now, did you just record and then eat some food and and then or I'm sorry, did you train and then eat some food and sit down and record or how did that day pan out? We didn't even we didn't even eat. Like he just wanted to like I would have rather recorded than trained and then eaten. Yeah. But he just wanted to he didn't he didn't want to sit for a little while and then go train legs because it was huh. a leg day for me and he kind of trains whatever now he just kind of like mixes it up. Yeah. And uh, so he's like, let's let's train first. And I'm like, okay, I don't know if I want to know my name after I train legs. <laughs> but it came up, you know, literally that's not the best time for me to be trying to do any higher level processing yeah. normally. But I was, you know, I was okay. You were so, in rare form though. You were doing well. You were you were good. It, it, it is, and I've all, I've said this. Um, the RNT Fitness Podcast with the Akash. What's his last name? Hmm. Vegala, I think okay. I did that. Uh, like about came out about three weeks ago. Okay, um, and we recorded a long time ago. That would have been in the um, sitting in the queue for like months. Um, and someone said, "Man, you were on for that podcast. It was a, it was it was like one of your best ever." And I was like, "It's just those guys are asking me really good questions." Mm, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Ben, Ben, literally, we were actually talking. I think he does does this intentionally, probably with people he has on the podcast that he trains. We chatted in the gym a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and he was coming with ideas at one point because he doesn't really train his calves anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was training calves, and he scooted over uh, to the side of the gym and started writing down ideas. Okay. So he had all of his thoughts and questions he wanted to ask me written down and pre-formulated. Okay. That he picked up on from what we're doing in the gym, and that's like that. why he had like, yeah. So that's really like when you ask good questions, insightful questions, and Ben likes to kind of um, sort of stump people to a certain degree, you know, okay. not stump them, but like dig in on something that maybe is a different angle than someone's normally taken. Yeah, make that it a little bit makes, of a challenge, right? Absolutely, like that. That's much more fun for me. Yeah. So yeah, I, I kind of like to rise to the to the speculative challenge. 
Yeah. It is. It was cool. It was cool. And how, how was the workout overall? He said he's been on no carbs. He's doing a cyclical keto diet. So he was on very low carbs. And this was like his... Now, you said in the podcast that uh, was it on average people... It, it is said to carb up uh, uh, after two workouts of a body part. Like you shouldn't do more than two workouts of one body part before you get some carbs in you, something like that, was it? It's funny because I'm hearing you say that, and I just listened to you and DJ talk about that. I don't yeah. even know that you listened to the podcast. You heard him telling you what was on the podcast? or No, I, I was the one. I heard that part. I heard yeah. that part. Okay, yeah. I couldn't remember what he – because he was we actually what I had said. We both had listened to it. I forgot. I th- okay. Now, I couldn't remember if I had listened to the end. And then once he started saying, he was saying Ben was on keto, then I remembered. I was like, oh, yeah, because I listened to that whole part and how Ben was saying that, you know, he had been doing a cyclical keto diet and he had been training for about, I think it was like three, four weeks straight without any kind of a carb up. That's the rule of thumb that I have used okay. regularly with people is you, you run out of glycogen. It depends on the... We cover this extensively in the podcast, but it depends on the um, the volume of training that you're doing. It depends on how much. If you're really on a ketogenic diet, then you're getting really zero carbs coming in. But there can be some glycogen synthesis. There's an adaptation that will happen mm. over the long haul with people that have been on on low carb diets, where they they can gradually, you know, have some creeping up of glycogen. They won't be as full as if they're, you know, taking in a thousand grams a day. Okay. But um, that's a rule of thumb because you just see what he saw. Like literally, he'd be going and Ben trains hard. He's like, yeah. So, He's no stranger to hard training, you know, and you could just see is like all of a sudden, like those grinder reps would just be whoop, like the muscle was just giving out, just done. Yeah. And you probably experienced that before. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Like where you just like, there's no pump, um, there's no burn because you're not producing metabolites of lactic acid um, and everything else that would give you that sensation of a burn and a pump. It just, this is not there because you don't have the energy turnover you don't have metabolite accumulation you don't have the metabolic stress because you don't have the glycogen yeah so you just like go and go and go and all of a sudden it's like it's like someone cut the switch like someone just cut the wire it's like what the hell so he had a little bit i could just see it in the way in his fatigue profile okay he would just go 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 instead of like you know grind 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 he would just go and go go and just drop off yeah yeah so yeah i've been paying attention and now i just listened to that maybe the middle of, i think tuesday wednesday wednesday of last week i listened and I've been paying attention in my workout since what my fatigue what what my fatigue looks like in the gym. Where you had said, you know, you start out strong, and then over time those reps begin to slow down. Tra- traditionally, that's if you're if you have if you have a decent amount of glycogen in your body, and then you get to a point where they get so slow that you you're grinding, and then they fail. Versus you're saying Ben just like he would go go go, and then just there was just nothing. That's what I saw in, okay. in a way that I wouldn't have expected because Ben knows how to train hard. He wasn't giving up okay. psychologically or neurologically. It was a muscular failure. Okay. Locus, I would say. But the thing is, like that fatigue profile, and you can see this when you when you um, subject skeletal muscle to electrical stimulation or, or <laughs> e-stim. I had a, someone on my, on my – um, I'm not sure where he's from. He's a foreigner. He doesn't speak – English is not his native tongue, so I can't – I understand what that's like. But he posts, he's like, Ben's podcast, he's like, he's like, e-steam, esteem, like, what is all this e-steam? He was spelling it, like, 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 as in self-esteem? Yeah, yeah. And he's like, e-steam, he's like, what is this, what are you talking about? And I guess I did not fully said electrical stimulation. <laughs> he had no idea what e-steam was. Okay. And he's like, what is e-steam, what is that? And he couldn't figure it out from context. I'm like, oh my gosh. Poor guy, like we went for like 10 minutes talking about electrical stimulation and he didn't have any idea what the hell was going on. It yeah. was been just totally frustrating for him. Um, so the muscle fiber type, the fuel that it has, um, those will all make a difference in terms of the, uh, the fatigue profile. Hmm. Okay. So if you're running out of glycogen, you'll have this kind of bonking phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got more type 1 fibers, there'll be a more gradual um, fatigue Okay. Then, if you have more fast switch fibers, they fatigue. They're, they're fast fatigable. They're fatigue huh. more, more readily. Okay. That's yeah. And there's different ways. This is we can get a whole fiber typing um, phenomenology, which is just a gigantic bowl of wax. I have a YouTube video where I cover that. But people equate like fast fibers with um, type two and slow with type one. Yeah. Well, type refers to the myosin heavy chain. Fast and slow refers to contractile properties. Okay. 
those things are associated, and myosin is a major myosin heavy chain is the major determinant of of twitch speed, which is where fast or slow comes from. But they're not the same. Okay. It's almost it's not. This isn't a perfect analogy, but it's kind of like saying, um, you know, all four by fours are trucks. Hmm. And it's not necessarily true. You can have, for instance, um, like uh, type one fibers tend to, tend to be oxidative. Okay. Um, they tend to be slow. Um, so you can talk about slow oxidative fibers and fast glycolytic fibers, SO and FG. Oxidative refers to mitochondrial content. Glycolytic refers to glycolytic enzyme content. I'm hanging in there as best as I can. <laughs> These are all just different properties of skeletal muscles that can be tested in order to, to delineate them. Okay. So you can say you can say you have big people, you can have tall people, and here, here's a, actually this is probably a better analogy: um, tall people and short people. Okay. And then you can have heavy people and light people. Mm. Not all short people are light, and not all heavy people are tall. Yeah. You can have someone who's like real thin, is really tall, and they are, can be outweighed by a by a person with a higher BMI who's very short. Okay, and that happens in fibers. You can have actually have higher oxidative enzymes in what would be categorized as type two fibers. Hmm. You'll see that like endurance athletes who train those type two fibers. So they have type two myosin, which normally you would think of as being associated with higher glycolytic enzyme activity and lower oxidative mitochondrial content but they can actually be higher than the type 1s. So people just equate all those, and, like, no one ever measures twitch speed in humans. Like, it never, like, people don't do that shit, hardly at all. People talk about fast and slow twitch. Yeah, that's so a, that's so, about what I know. Yeah, people just call it fast and slow. It's just, like, that's sort of like a layman's term. So, and even, I've even heard people who are, um, uh, who are, who are PhDs who, who will use that just because it's just the, the kind of the lay nomenclature. But it misses out on all the really pretty fucking phenomenally at least to me interesting aspects of muscle physiology hmm. um, so anyway so so um the thing i was going to say like to get away from some of the didactic stuff uh is that one thing you can do is say um so if someone is bonking in the gym let's say they're low on carbs um you gotta this is something you have to use with some reservation sparingly but um, so let's say if you were fully carved up, you would be getting 12 to 15. Let's say you're getting 15 reps with a given weight. Okay. And because you're low on glycogen, you only get 12. So you, you bonk. You can eke out the loading, get those extra three reps by taking a pause in between. Mm, sure, absolutely. So literally, yeah, yeah. So you can do that. and But the thing is, you, then you end up potentially wrecking your nervous system. Mm. Um, so you can, or you can do a little bit higher volume, which would make sense. So, you know, do or do a rest, pa do a cluster set. So let's say you want to do, um, uh, this is probably a better way, 15 reps. You might do a set of 10 and, and take a breather and then do a set of five. Sure. Like a, like a, a two-stage DC training style rest pause set. And that's actually one of the things we did. I don't know if gonna, what the video is going to come out. We filmed in the gym. We did a thing... Um, uh, it, that Ben likes to do. So we did a couple muscle rounds. Okay. Because he has some really a really nice knee extension, really nice hamstring curl in there, and I wanted to use those. And unfortunately, I had a hamstring. My hamstring was tweaked. Mm. I think it actually it's my IT band. Okay. Um, it started bothering me, and, and it was just, I could tell. I had to cut the, the rest, the, the muscle round short because uh, it was going to go. I was like, no was kidding. Like, nope. Yeah, it, it, it had popped. Um, there was a snap that oh. didn't injure anything. I thought I had torn my uh the biceps femoris tendon but i think it was just the it band popping across the tibial plateau okay and it just it messed me up for weeks oh, and it geez. was getting there i'm like so i had to stop but how's it doing I'm, now by the way it's, it's it's gonna be fine i just gotta stretch my it band all right um yeah i know i know how to fix it now i it, I, I figured it out months ago but it was just kind of coming back at me but i can still do leg presses and squats and compound stuff yeah it's just the just the hamstring curls tend to be an issue so Anyway, so we, we did a couple of muscle rounds. Then we went to what um, a thing that Ben likes to do, and I think it was sets of five. Hmm. It's kind of it was a cluster set, cluster drop set, hmm. which I really liked. And um, I liked it because it was based on 
<laughs> you're going to like this. It, it's not, it doesn't fit with kind of the idea of, of accruing as much volume as possible with limiting the, the nervous system taxation like I do in fortitude training. Basically, it's with it go. It's it's geared at trying to make things as hard as possible. Okay. Um, on yourself, so you 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 pick a weight you can get like. Um, maybe it was eight. I can't remember. We have to see the video because I, I went heavier. Um, I think than I was thinking I was going to, but I just went ahead and did it. So I think it was maybe let's say I think they were set to six. Let's say there were six or five. Okay. Like, okay. And so pick a weight you can get six with. So I, I think I did like a double, and I'm like. All right, I'm going to take a long fucking time before I can get four more of these, but I'm going to do it. Okay. This is on a hack squat. And he had set it up. He, he loves to do this. This is um, this was a very unusual one for me. Actually, uh, we had the, the toes, um, heels were raised. He put a wedge in there, so it was very oh. quad dominant. I couldn't engage my glutes. No kidding. My hamstring, my posterior chain really at all, like nothing. Of course, you're on a hack squat, so hmm. you can't, like, drive your ass back. Yeah. The posterior chain at all. So it was so, like a very, very quad dominant hack squat yeah i've never done that i've never wedged my heels up on a hack squat before that's interesting he's not like there's like a dozen metal wedges in that gym that's I don't know badass why so many of them yeah like literally like more more than you could put in all the racks and all the machines where they could be used huh. they're, they're everywhere huh. it's like they, like they had a double order or something like someone <laughs> oh shit you know they didn't come and they ordered them again yeah um they are all over the place. Like maybe it's like maybe he has the full set from like two degrees to like twenty degrees, and he's got everything in between. But um, so you do something you can get five reps with. And mm -hmm. literally, I was like, I think I did like a double or triple. Bunch of breasts. I did a single. Bunch of breasts. What's a, a what's a bunch of rest? Like how long would breath, you guess? Breath. A bunch oh, of breaths. 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 So breath. All right. So how long do you figure you stop? Just out of curiosity. 10 seconds. Okay. Because okay. I wouldn't have gotten the rep if I hadn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I picked like a two rep max and I got like five <laughs> or six reps with it. Yeah. Um, that's why it was so much fun because it was fucking brutal because I had to rest that long. Yeah. And then he pulled a plate off. And it was like, it was like five or six plates on this hack squat. I can't remember which. And then you're supposed to, and then, and then you wait until you, you waited long enough until you think you can get five or six reps more. I can't remember if we're doing five or six. Oh, yeah. Um, so you just like you, so you don't wait like really long. You want to wait until like you think you're you want to make it as brutal on yourself as possible. Yeah. So I didn't wait very long, and I so I got another double. And like the next one took me like it felt like it took me like an hour. It was probably like a minute to do like six reps. You know. Jeez. And then you pull another one off, and then I did the same thing again. So it was a fun set, and it, it was you know of course, and Ben was motivating me and. uh the uh, Trevor, who's the videographer, he was laughing, <laughs> I <hear him laughs> laughing, because I was because I was making it so hard. And I guess maybe this I don't know. I'll have to ask Ben. I didn't ask him, but this is maybe something they do a lot. And people probably rest like a minute, mm. and I rested like twenty seconds. I'm I just like I'm getting back fuck in there. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it was it was fun. So that was like, it was like literally, probably. A dozen reps that if I tried to do a double, I would have I would have failed. Jeez! So they were like a dozen like max effort reps essentially over the course of that thing. So mm -hmm. that was a fun set. So With, that was cool. I like those. How did you uh, How did you feel uh, the next day, like soreness wise? Because you mentioned in the podcast too that you tend to get more sore versus some guys don't. I was I was fine. You I've been fine? training. Really hard. I've been doing like five and six step six stage drop sets. Okay. Um, and all sorts of crazy shit. So I'm, but not very much. That was all we did. We did two, two, two muscle rounds. Actually, I was feeling kind of shitty that day. I had, um, I was cleaning up around my house. The guys are done now and I got oh, exposed nice. to something. Ugh. Um, yeah, there was a, a big box full of, uh, drywall and stuff. It yeah. was actually a cycling bin. I went to dump it into the trash and the cycling bin. I don't know why they put it in there. They just did because it was a recycling bin. It had like probably, 70 pounds of that shit in there no oh, god broke the recycling pin fell on the ground and gave me a blasted with a big puff of smoke oh jeez like, i think it was a mold infested stuff anyway yeah but i was fine i was you know i was as sore as i normally am but you know we didn't do well, that was it i think i think then i trained calves and abs and biceps okay oh so that wasn't very much okay but, that's cool. Now, I know, you know, Ben Pakalski, I know he's downsized a lot. That's been a, a big thing he's talked about, you know, since he had... 270 still. So so he's not, that, that's what I was going to say. 
he had downsized, but is he he that does not sound downsized at all to me then. He's, he, th- he, he, he he just can't get his weight down. Wow. We talked about it. Yeah. Wow. That's why he hasn't said no carbs for like three or four weeks, and he's still 270. <laughs> oh, my God. And how do his legs look? Because they were always such a strong point on him. You said he's he not even them, training calves. He had them totally covered up because calves are, you know, giant. Yeah. Um, and they, you could tell his, I mean, his thighs are probably twice the circumference of mine. Oh, my God, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's just he's, nuts. They're just, they're just like, you can just see when you see someone whose legs are that big, yeah. you know. They just don't look real, like it belongs on a, an, an animal other than a human. Yeah, yeah. It's like that. That's like that belongs on some kind of a bull or some shit. You know. That's so crazy. So he, man. He's big. Yeah, he's two. He's two seventy. And he's I think we're about the same height. Okay. Maybe yeah. he's an inch or two taller or something. Okay. Oh so, yeah. That's crazy. So he's, he's just big. You know, his legs are just naturally big. I and mean, he's he's not. You know, it's funny because I used I think I used more weight than him on the knee extension. Hmm. The hamstring curl. I don't remember the same weight. And then. He had an extra plate on that hack squat. So okay. I, I used six and he used seven maybe or five and six. It's one of the two. And he, that's something probably like that. something too he was very used to doing versus that you've never, like you said, you had never done that like that before. Yeah. He, he, he that was his comfort spot. Like yeah. if, you, if you watch he squats, um, he squats like feet close together and he's pretty upright. That's his natural squatting position, I think. Okay. Um, and like when he like that's sort of a natural from what I've seen I haven't watched him lift a lot but I could I could just tell that was a very natural groove for him okay. and I was like you know how you're like you're trying to figure out your groove and I was like I was adju- like on all the warm up sets I'm adjusting my feet and adjusting the angle of my my hips like trying to find a, I never really found a sweet spot so it was always awkward but um yeah but his legs are just ridiculous and he's you know crystal perfect form you know very very smooth controlled form so that's pretty badass hey uh off topic from that i wanted to tell you about this so this had to be two episodes ago i was telling you how i was coming down with a case of golf elbow and you told Mm -hmm. me you know you're you were saying well what exercises are doing and i said really everything is hurting it at this point and you said well you have to take time off i did end up taking a week off I've been working on stuff. You know, I got, I went to some FST therapy. I've been icing. I was icing post workout. I took about seven days off of training upper body. I still trained legs twice that week. Honey Rambod treated you? Is what you're telling me? <laughs> FST? What's no. FST for the listeners? Uh, fascio stretch uh, technique. And okay. uh, that's uh, Becky Wilson over here at Tri Covery. She's a, a great, great therapist. And uh, actually, Victoria and I went together. So she worked on Victoria's mm-hmm. neck and uh, she worked on my elbow. But she also said, she said, like, this is a case of inflammation and it's not something that she can really do a lot of direct work with. The key is getting the inflammation down and rest is going to be the key, just like you said. So I did take a lot of rest. Mm-hmm. I've been working on some therapy exercises for it. And this is what I wanted to show you. I picked up a, uh, a TENS unit, which I am using right now. I've got this thing hooked up to the underside of my elbow here. You can see I've actually got it turned up probably a little louder or a little stronger than I should, but it'll actually make my hand, hold on, flex a little bit (laughs) every time it goes on Mm -hmm. if I have it turned up really good. But I only paid 35 bucks for it, and it's working really well, man. So it's – What's it doing for you? It's – well, I'm finding that it seems to – it just it's giving me pain relief, really. I I don't even know – you know how to how to how to break that down, but I'm putting it in the area. It's almost like, it's almost like in that joint. There's like a, a spot I can't rub. There's a, like a spot I can't mm-hmm. massage, and it's getting in there for me. And I think that it's kind of helping to bring blood flow in. Uh, my guess is that it's bringing blood flow in and helping to carry away waste materials when I use it. Um, but I've just been using it a couple times a day for 20 minutes a time, 30 minutes a time, and I've noticed a difference. It seems to be helping. What What are your thoughts overall on tens units? Um, well, first, it's it's interesting that you're. Um, and it sounds like she's really good because she's the one who helped you with your shoulder. She is, yeah, pack, yeah, and she really helped you out there. Yeah, it's funny because I have treated um, golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. It's pretty common with Twaina with. Uh, um, body body work, twin out body work, Chinese body work, directly, um, effectively, efficaciously. Okay. Multitude of times, you, go, you can you can treat it in just a few treatments. Really? Um, yeah, like directly. Um, so 
She didn't want to do that, but it can be done. I know it because because I've done it before. Okay. Tennis elbow too has been kind of crazy. I've had, I've had friends with tennis elbow and treated it once and it went away. You're like, kidding literally. me. You're kidding yeah, me. No, uh-uh. Yeah. yeah, people just don't know. So I passed it along, not to like. As a Rudy Toot Toot thing, but just so people know that um, a good a good body worker, and I, you know, I was, I was just kind of beginner really, but um, you can you can treat golfers and tennis elbow pretty pretty effectively. Well, let me ask um, you then, because this is something I'm not familiar with. Mm-hmm. Uh, who who would I go to for like how would I find somebody to treat me with this type of modality? Find an acupuncturist. Okay, I, who does body work? Okay, who's um uh. AOBTA, Asian Oriental Body Therapy Association, AOBTA, okay. credited, ideally, or just someone who does Twain Ah. Or if you could just like find someone who is literally is Chinese or who learned it in a lineage, okay. those will be really good people. The best are a lot of times people who do um, Kung Fu, Kung Fu, um, or Xing Yi and Bagua, like some of the, the um, uh, internal martial arts. Okay. So go to a dojo type of place and huh. find someone who wants to call it a dojo, but find someone who does. And those are the guys who know know this shit because they beat each other up and then they fix each other so they can beat each other up again. No kidding. That's okay. who I learned the Twain Ah from, okay. from, or martial artists. That's the origin of it. Huh. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and there's liniments that you would use, um, in this in this instance to help things go away. Yeah. So. Yeah, my approach would be probably a lot different than what you're doing, but um, not that there's not different ways to skin the cat. But like, so that that's who you want to find. You can just go to AccuFinder.com, okay, and you can find lots of people there. Um, it's an easy one. All right, yeah. I'll definitely Accu check Finder. that out then. Yeah. I'll definitely check yeah. that out. And see so what I can do. Yeah. But um, so tens is transcutaneous electroneurostimulation. And the basic premise of it is basically just to fatigue um, the neural conduction pathways that transmit pain from that area up to your brain. Hmm. So you basically just you just keep stimulating until the until you don't feel any pain because the the nerves are are, are gone. And th- those things you said that can happen. Obviously, the contraction and you know you can reduce inflammation that kind of stuff. But the idea of what the tens does per se, like its main mechanism of action, is just a, it's just pain relief. So it's not going to actually fix this for me, is what you're telling me. Or fix ele- is relative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So fix is relative. So I don't want to uh, just relieve pain, you know, and, and mask further problems. That's you know what I right. mean. I, I want to fix this so that it's gone. Restoration of normal movement pattern is a lot of times important to remedy okay. this sort of situation. So if you're in pain. And you're not moving normally. You're not using things normally to some degree. Ah, um, that can that can um, perpetuate the pain. I see. I so, see. like, here's a good, here's a story. So, there's a guy. Um, he was the the master. He was the guy who taught the guys who taught me Twain Ah. Yeah. And I, and I don't know. He was sort of a kind of legendary. You know, when I start off in school, everyone would talk about him. It was Vince Black. Um, he was trained in China. He was a, just like this like undefeatable martial artist. You know, he could just like go like that with his fingers and, you know, you'd be on your back unconscious. And you're like, how the hell did he just do that? He just knocked me out like the flip of his of his pinky. And, he's, and he was an incredible bone setter, too. So bone setting is the term in Chinese medicine for what you would call kind of a chiropractic manipulation. But you can't call it that Okay. in, a, in Chinese medicine because that's under the scope of practice of chiropractors and DOs. Yeah. I guess MDs can in some states, but. So, but bone setting predates chiropractic by thousands of years. They've been doing that, popping bones, setting necks, setting shoulders and joints for thousands of years in China. It's part of, it's sort of advanced part of the Twain Ah, um, or in the body work that I know. So he's like just amazing with that stuff. He could just go and like set your, everything in your body in a matter of just a couple of minutes. Mm. So I go in, I, but I, I had never met him before. I didn't know him. And I went in, I was having some problems with my knee. So I went into his clinic, which was off campus, and actually one of my fellow students who was interning there and working at the counter was there, and she checked me in, and we're kind of chatting, and I'm like looking around like at all the cool stuff on the wall, the diplomas and the certificates and all the pictures of him in China and yeah. you know all the letters, all the cool shit. You know? and, but, but my knee was really – it was bothering me pretty badly. I had chondromalacia patella, so 
patellofemoral syndrome pain under, under my kneecap. Oh yeah, yeah. It was really, and it was it was popping. I think I had um a little uh, little piece of cartilage that was slipping around in there. Um, to be honest. So anyway, um, a plica it's called. Sometimes you can get a little piece of cartilage that's sort of like folded up on itself. So I could I would feel this pop whenever I try to do a leg press or a squat, and it would hurt like shit. So it was, I was dealing with that for like months and months and months. Well, I'm, I'm in the waiting room. I'm waiting and I'm waiting and waiting. And this guy comes in and sits down and starts reading the newspaper. You know, I'm just another patient. Oh, um, and um, I kind of chit-chat with him. And he's like, oh, you know, you just, you know, making small talk. And then um, and then he gets up and he, and he leaves. And then they bring me back. And they, they usually do some cranial sacral to get me relaxed, get you relaxed for the body work whatever the Vince was going to do in the acupuncture and everything else, just to sort of get you sort of into a baseline uh, mode. And this guy that I met in the waiting room walks in. <laughs> You're kidding. That's Vince. You're kidding. He was, he was scoping me out. Huh. He wanted to see how I was moving when I wasn't knowing that I was being observed. Wow. So rather than like say, okay, stand up, sit down for me, where people do things differently because they know they've got the physician. Yeah the acupuncture physician watching them. He wanted to see how I moved around. And so he was watching me get up and move around and do things. Huh. And so one of the things he said to me was stop moving like you're so injured. Hmm. Stop accommodating so oh, much. Oh, I see. Because I was. I was trying to stay off of it because it bothered me. And I, I was sort of at a loss. It's been going on for quite a while. You are babying it, um, basically. You are trying to take ca- not, take I, take care and protect it. No, I mean, I hadn't, I hadn't baby, I had done the opposite. I just tried trained through it for months and months oh. and months. No, and but I mean I was, now, because he said, stop, stop treating it like it's injured. I don't know like at that time. Okay. I okay. I don't know what I was doing at that time. But okay. I was, I was, I was moving in an abnormal way. Okay. And he was, I think his advice was, you know, try to stand up normally, just slow yourself down, huh. you know, and, you know, you m- use a normal movement pattern. So you can start ingraining that. And yeah. that's, and that's something that, um, that I actually employ a lot of times with people when they're shoulder injuries, and this isn't medical advice for anybody, so sure. I can't really say that, um, is that, like, uh, this is actually, a, it's related to a Dante Trudell um, thing that he put out years ago, the broomstick stick stretch. Mm. It's a circumduction stretch for the shoulder that works phenomenally well for lots of shoulder injuries, where you take a, a broomstick and you bring it, I can't show it like my chair here, bring it over back behind you and the, up the front and back and forth. Right. And so it's circumduction. Circumduction is this movement twirling around in the shoulder joint. Okay. And if you can do that with a big wide range of motion um, without any pain, you're going to have a healthy shoulder. And when I show people that, and I've shown them people, been showing people that for years and years and years now, and it's fixed a lot of shoulders and mine as well. Um, I will suggest people do that at the where there's no pain, but go as slow as you need to go to do, to avoid any sort of painful movement. Mm. So Vince was kind of telling me the same thing, if I'm recalling correctly, was like, try to get up normally. Don't like just use the other leg and, and baby, you know, the bad knee or, you know, accommodate it in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Get up normally. Take your time. Wow. so That doesn't hurt. And there's there's a retraining of the nervous system that can happen there. Huh. Interesting. So so there's a connection there. I mean, I don't know in your case, you know, I'd have to see you if I were if I were treating you as an acupuncturist, but um, where the tens unit can help people to do that. Hmm. They don't have pain anymore. So they start going about like now you wouldn't like want to put the tens unit on and like go in the gym and go hog wild on exercises that cause the pain in the first place. That right. would be right. it's not very smart, obviously, but but you can go back to normal day to day day to day living in a way, and this sort of creates a kind of a bridge to go from, oh shit, I can't use my arm for anything to I can start you know using your left hand unless the image is reversed. No, nope, you're, you're correct. Yeah, yeah. Which I had I had looked for a letter there. I see on your microphone. So, um, so yeah. So you're not. I don't think you're a lefty, but you do correct. use your left hand every once in a while for typing. I feel it. You know, that's yeah. you know, typing. Anything yeah. else? Training. Yeah. So, so this gets you towards, you know, some normalcy of, of movement. Oh, oh. Delivery. Mail? <laughs> I don't know, Amazon. Uh. I have a don't knock on the door, but they still they have to knock, I think. Yeah. Hold on. Hey, Suki. You let them know, didn't you? Now Suki. I can actually see the tails wagging. 
Uh, yeah, versus versus I audio, I just hear the that's, dogs. That's Big Blitzy's tail, I think, in the back, the big one, yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the idea. But, uh, you know, a TENS unit, it, it can be just a masking thing, to be honest. Mm. Well, I don't want it to be that, you know. That's yeah. for sure. So I mean, oh, hold on just a sec. Yeah. Suki, come here. Come on. Come here, Suki. Aw. That's Foxy. There's a little fox. Suki. Here comes come here. Suki. She'll just keep barking unless I call her off. Good girl. That's a, come here, Suki. 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 You little biscuit. You're sure just a little brown biscuit, aren't you? Okay. You let them know. <laughs> um, she'll just bark and bark and bark. Like, like I have to like get her to go away from the door. She'll just keep it up. Um, what was I going to say? You're saying it, it could be just a masking unit, uh, a masking method just to, to cover up the pain. Oh, so yeah, so what you you have medial epicondylitis is what golfer's elbow is. Okay. So, the um, the forearm flexors here connect um, mainly to the medial epicondyle, which is part of the humerus. So that's that's your pain right there, right? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis. Golfer's elbow is golfers golfers are swinging the golf club like this, and yeah. tennis are doing backstroke like that. Or backhand, get a stroke like that. So, um, do you, are you stretching your forearm? I am. Yeah, that's your- that's the majority of the physical therapy that I found has been stretching techniques. And so, Huge. what I've been doing is applying those things when I go to the gym. So I'll still go and I'll do cardio. And I've been, you know, what the other thing is, Scott. I think that with training, I was just telling this to a guy uh, that I work with. He hurt his back. And it's the first, he's a younger guy. It's the first time he's really hurt himself. And I can tell you from personal experience, once I hurt my back, what did I do? I took a little time off, but then I got in there to, to quote unquote, see what I could do. Mm -hmm. And then I would push it and hurt myself again. And I'd continue to do that. So I know that, you know, with, with stopping, I still wanted to be able to find a challenge. And so I've found that I've challenged myself with higher intensity cardio because I can, I can get like some mental satisfaction out of doing that, get my heart rate up. And then I go to do these stretches, um, afterward and and the the physical therapy stuff. And I, and I have found it to be pretty helpful. Most of the stretches have been the stuff. It's things that I found off of YouTube that have been, uh, therapy treatments for, for golf elbow. I've had tennis elbow Mm -hmm. before, which was slightly different, you know, in, in a different, different fix. I'd actually been to physical therapy for that a couple times, but uh, that's been years and years now. The, the, these, like I said, though, they're mostly stretches that, that I'm working on that, that bring all of this, that bring all this out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just gotta, that's super important. Yeah. Um, I could show you, like, are you doing one where you're supinated like this? I can't see your hand right now. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's an important one. Yeah. You can find where it's tight. Yeah, um, you know, I've talked about you know stretching is sort of an intuitive thing, like find the tight spot and then stretch there. Yeah, within yeah. reason. But yeah, you can figure out where it's tight, loosen right. it up. But I mean, golfers and tennis elbow, it's a crazy thing because people it will go on for months and years. Oh yeah, and it's fixable in days. Yeah, in a lot of cases. So anyway, I hope you got get it. Um, it's doing a lot better. Therapy. It's doing a lot better. Yeah. I just don't want to. I, and, and I'm going to go train today. So I'm going to see, actually test it out now lightly and see how that works out. Cause it's been, it's been over a week now since I've trained uh, anything upper body. And so I've got a, I've got a plan in action. I'm not going to do anything that requires a lot of gripping and uh, you know, I'm going to continue to do the therapy stuff as well. So, so um, I mean, I guess I'll throw this out here. Like, you can train almost everything upper body without gripping. That's yeah, and that's that's where I'm going with this. So I'm I'm getting rid of some of and and mostly the stuff I'm using is going to be machine based, just so that I can get started without having to stabilize anything in any way, without having to say grab a dumbbell and hold on to it and 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 control it from twisting stuff like that. I mean, I'm talking about without having to use your hands at all. Like you can use like isolator fitness. Oh yeah, they yeah. make the isolator bags, and I've got some videos. We talked about this before on the podcast, where you can use uh, ab slings or ab hang ups that you put on your upper arm. Yes, and you can do like yeah. a pull down with those. Mm-hmm. Those are pretty you great. Do pec flies with those on a cross mm. cable machine. Mm, yeah, so, um, you can do uh, bent over rows on a Smith machine with those. You can do side laterals. You can do overhead presses on cables. Hmm. Those like go to if you go to Isolator Fitness, you can you can actually buy those. It's a really good option for someone who um, 
like someone who's actually like got their wrist in a cash or something like that. Oh yeah. Like you could like people like, Oh, I can't train for two months. It's like, actually you could do almost everything, huh. you know, pretty safely, you know, as long as you don't have like, as long as you're truly, you know, casted yeah, and you're not just like, you know, you don't have bones that are, you know, not mended and they're floating around, but yeah, um, yeah you can, tr- you can train like really effectively with that. And they don't market it that as a, it's not a rehab device, okay. but it's a fucking, they're badass. They're really, are pretty cool. And it's a novel stimulus. Yeah, yeah, it so is. Isn't I it? use those. Oh, totally, totally, man. You have you have them so, yourself? No, they're so expensive. I just every time I want to go buy them, I'm like ah, yeah, they're like it's like two hundred and twenty bucks, I think, for the full set or something like that. And yeah, that's I probably cheap. should. Yeah, and and it does. I think it takes a little while, like to set up. Oh yeah, actually, with the ab slings. Uh, well, once you put them on, you put the cuff on, and you and then you have carabiners, then you're good to go. Yeah. I think, you know, you just leave them on, but, um, you just walk around the gym looking like uh DLB circa 2007. Yeah. Remember she yeah. was the model for them. And Seth Rossi. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Her- that was Seth for Rossi. That's right. Yeah. Young Seth for Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now they have another, another model. I don't know who she is. There's a the one. Hello, little Fox. Yeah. Can they would have to pay Seth for Oh little my gosh. Hello, Foxy. I'm going to, I got to pan the screen over here so people my can see niche. her. My goodness. It's a little fox. I had what to pan doing? the screen so people could see her. What? What? <laughs> what are you doing? You coming back up here? Come on. What are you doing? <laughs> she looks like a fox, doesn't she? She does, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, let's take a quick break. Yep. And okay, cool. uh, we'll be back in just a minute, guys. We've got a bunch of questions from Scott's message board this week. And yep. uh, we'll see you guys in just a second. Cool. S- Scott, can I take a moment to. Uh, to plug the book, I see one behind you. I see one behind yeah, you over there. Yeah, there. there is behind me. There's a bunch. I have them everywhere. Yeah, I use them as doorstops. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm I'm looking through the book right now. I'm going to just mention. Uh, first of all, I, I'm gonna right in the front here. You have basically this is your intake form, isn't it? Um, maybe uh, what page was it on? It's right near the front of the book. I just missed it. But it basically is the intake form that you use, am I correct, to, uh, to, uh, to talk to a new client, to, to kind of find out what you want to know about them. Kind of. Yeah, it's based on that. It's the personal bodybuilding inventory. Personal bodybuilding inventory. Yeah, okay. it's available on my website. Okay. And free. Okay. As a downloadable PDF form that you can use and print out and then clear. I mean, I literally I made it a, a, a field-based form oh, that no you type kidding. right into. No kidding. On your computer, yeah. Okay. Or your phone if you want, I guess. Well, what I was going to mention was that it's oh. in the book, too. And um, I, I know that uh, this is something I think is important that I've had people that reach out to me and I send them my questionnaire. And then they say, hi, you know, you're asking questions I hadn't even thought of before. And I think that a lot of times uh, with coaching, being able to, a lot of it is logical stuff, but maybe sometimes we don't know the questions to ask. And so just the quick, simple point I was going to make is that with Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach, I think it's a way that right there in itself is one step where you can start looking at some of the questions that you need to ask yourself. And I know that's a very simple way of uh, making a statement about the book, but I did want to say one positive thing about it. Uh, while, while, because I wanted to make this into kind of like a mini commercial. So, uh huh. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Be your own bodybuilding coach, guys. You can check it out at amazon.com. You can pick up the hardcover. If you're international, you can get it at Barnes and Noble, or you can go to byobbcoach.com and you can get the ebook there. Scott, is there another place that you can pick it up? Barnes and Noble, Amazon, my site. And then there's all the pirated versions that people are selling all over the place that I suggest you not get. Yeah, don't get unless those. Unless you're dastardly. Yeah, don't get those. Yeah. Um, I'm looking here. I want to see if we can put this up. Oh, cool. But because I because I mean part of the book is not to make money. People are like, oh my god, you're charging a hundred dollars for the book. I'll have a com-. someone made a comment on that. Yeah. Let me um let me send you this picture. We can put this up. So if you go to my site, actually let me add that in there. I'll send you a picture. We can put up on the screen. You will find you don't have to buy the book for this. You don't have to. You can if you want. I would love for you to, but um, if you just want to use the form, I'll send this to you, Scott. There we go. All right. This is kind of a screen capture. Um, just 
came through on your phone. There um, it is. Yeah. You can download the form. Like I spent hours and hours. Um, use, I have Adobe Acrobat, so I put together an actual PDF form. Okay. That um, you just type in your stuff, and you can leave it filled out, and you go back and change the goals. Or you could just start from scratch. And then there's a there's a clear button to clear all the forms. Hmm. It's like a professional form that anyone can use. Hmm. Um, and I know people. You probably are probably hundreds of coaches, you know, using it as their own. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I even had one person ask me, said, "Hey, can you send that to me, but without your logos on there?" I'm like, click. Like, I just use whiteout. I use whiteout on your logo, and then I well, scratch okay, my name that, in. That's, well, they wanted me to like make an electronic version of the form for them. People are nuts, man. I, I know. I'm like, oh, okay. So, all right. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm like, come on. Like, you can't just give me like a little bit of like, some kudos for having put together the form. Right. right. Anyway. So, yeah, but that's there for people to use, you know. It's, that's just a, a freebie. And I, it's mainly there for, of course, people who want to follow the ideas in the book. You know, who wanted, who really want to, you know, be their own coach and check in repeatedly, you know, at the beginning of going from post contest to off season, off season to pre contest or whatever it may be. It's like, okay, where the hell am I? Yeah. When you get confused, here's the thing. Like I have, I mean, you know, I know you've seen this too. You have clients who like, they're just almost behaving randomly. They're like buying random shit and they're, yeah. at, or like are buying supplements or they're asking you like. They'll say, what, what do you know about this? Like kind of random questions, <laughs> yeah. right? And not that the questions are random because they're things that are curious, but it's like they they seem like they're just kind of coming out of nowhere. There's, there's off-topic, off t- tangential types of things. And a lot of times that's because they don't really know, they haven't redirected themselves. Mm. They forget what their goals are. They forget what they're, what they're trying to accomplish, where they're going. And that's why this form could be very, very helpful. Hmm. I've got room there for five goals. Okay. And it's really important, but I, I say, and you can see this on the picture if it's still up the screen, but specific and quantifiable. What, how, where, why, and what for. So, like, literally, so let's take a goal. Um, I want to win a show. Yeah. Okay. What What show? Hmm. And how are you going to win the show? So, like, you got to pick the show. How? Are you going to be bigger than before? Are you going to be better conditioned than before? Yeah. Are you going to be posing better than before? Of course, where is the show and when is the show? So, you got to have a date. That sets up, sets up your timeline. Yeah. It sets up, okay, so can I be ready in eight weeks to, 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 be, to meet those hows? Hmm. Or do I need 18 weeks? Um, and the whys and the what for are huge. This is where people will get, you know, why, would you, why does it matter if you win that show? Hmm. A lifelong dream of mine. You know, I um I I just made some horrible mistakes that I want to undo. Last time I did that show, I want to redeem myself. You know, the what for and the why are kind of the same, but there's sort of a different way of asking the same question that might resonate differently with people. Hmm. But you know, so why does winning a show even matter to you? Why does why does it matter if you win or you or you place last? You know, because um, winning is a standard of achievement. Like so, like literally, that's just that. Like someone said, okay, so what, what, so when someone asked, like, tell me about, like, uh, should I take HMB? And like, okay, where does that fit with your goals? Yeah. What is, what do we want to do? And it's like, so you go back to those goals. Like I need to eat in order to, in order to, to reach this goal of that show in X number of weeks, I need to follow my diet much better than the last time. Mm. My diet sucked. I kept on cheating, you know, blah, blah, blah. HMB does not fit in the plan for my goals because that's just a, so you can you can quickly go back to that that form and fill it out and it will clarify it'll like all those things that are just kind of this random like kind of a dust cloud of ideas and confusing uh, notions can be clarified by going back to that inventory and looking at it and filling it out again hmm. and starting and starting over if you need to like you could do that every month and just look at it and make sure you're just checking in with yourself. That's what a good coach does. A good coach, like someone sends you those those questions. Like, so why are you asking about HMB? Yeah. Where did you hear about this? Okay, what's going on with you? It's like, oh, I feel fat. It's like, why do you feel fat? It's like, well, you go to a new gym. There's a bunch of badasses at the gym. You want an advantage. <laughs> it's not you. You haven't changed. It's just a, you're just comparing yourself differently to people. Yeah. A good coach might go through that with someone if that were their, their situation. Hmm. That's what this that's what this form can do for someone in being your own coach is give you sort of a, a, a room for reverberating your own ideas and your own goals and your own um, notions of why you're doing this. Hmm. 
what for, how, when, blah, 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 um, in a way that a good coach can do. You can do it with yourself. Hmm. You can come to know yourself better using that form. So that's why I, I thought that was really important to come up with the, not just you got to buy the book and make photocopies, you know, blah, blah. People yeah. aren't going to do that. Download the thing and you can have it. Lily, you can go to the website and you can have it in the next five seconds if you want. I love that too. I, I, I think that it's important. It's just something that, and that's one of the things that's so simple um, is being able to, being able to determine like what your goals are. Mm-hmm. I, I think writing them down is a huge thing. And it's something I haven't always done, but I'm trying to get it in the habit of that uh, nowadays. I had been using a whiteboard. I kind of got away from it, but I'll set up even just like weekly goals, things that I want to achieve. And then yeah. once it's written down, um, you know, Victoria does that a lot. She has lists, tons of lists. We have lists on the refrigerator. She has her See, personal to-do yeah. list in the morning. Everything that she's doing, it's by a list and that she can set it up so that she can then systematically go through and check these things off, stay accountable. Um, and I, I like where you're going with it. So anyway, I just wanted to make a quick mention of the book and also of our sponsor that we mentioned at the beginning, True Nutrition. You guys can go to uh, truenutrition.com. Use our code advices for some additional savings. They got a lot of great products over there. I'm using their actually I'm drinking. Uh, this is the team skip that I'm drinking right now, Scott. It's uh raspberry. That, that, that almost doesn't sound right. Like that you say that, that it's the team skip protein blend. Yes. That you're drinking. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. The team, yes. <laughs> the team skip like, what? protein. Blend. I know what it is. It's uh, yes. But uh, I, you know, I'm using that right now. This is the what is it? Raspberry strudel. I preferred the strawberry sorbet personally better, but okay. I'm using raspberry right now. I'm gonna probably switch back after I'm done with this one. Um, but yeah, let me, let me toss something in related to those goals and how important they can and can't be. Sure. And it's related. This is um, I was thinking to myself, what have I learned new in the last? You know, someone asked me, what have I learned new? And there's something that's coming to my mind. Yeah. Um, and it, it, was, it actually sort of developed from doing those podcasts we talked about a little bit. And it's connected with goals and setting up extrinsic rewards for yourself. And there's a book. You still there? Okay. All right, you look frozen for a second. Um, by Daniel Pink. His last name is Pink, just like the, the singer. Um, but that's actually his last name. And it's just called Drive. And it's a phenomenal um, – Really, kind of, he repeats the same message over and over again. But he looks into um, the pretty, some of the pretty cool psychology. And I think I talked about this with Carl a little bit on the podcast of intrinsic versus ent- extrinsic motivation. And the long and short of it is, there's there's um, actually research with like rhesus monkeys, research with kids who are who tend to be artists, research with um, sort of in corporate settings with many, many studies actually with adults where if you set up some sort of extrinsic reward, like a monetary reward for some sort of achievement in the workplace or whatever it might be, anything that's involved with your life, you rob it of the intrinsic value of the fun. So the best, the best study that I think is just like, it's kind of sad is they took kids. Um, this is like in a preschool setting, the kids who naturally were artists and, um, they figured out who those kids were, and then they and then they um, came to him and said, "You know, your, your art is beautiful. You're wonderful. Um, we're going to give you um, if you if you draw another pretty picture, what have you? We're gonna we're gonna give you a reward. We're gonna give you um, I can't remember what they gave them, but they set up some extrinsic value in having done that. Yeah, and it extinguished the artistry. Really? It's, it, it were, yeah, they stopped painting. They stopped doing those things. Huh? It it stole the fun from it. Wow. So. Here's and here I'm going to connect this. Like okay. I think this is really fucking important. That's why I brought it up. Um, and I don't care if we don't get to questions on my board today because this is kind of an important thing. Cause it, this is that's why I'm like, just sitting back and listening. Yeah, this relates really. Like this is kind of like this really hit me pretty heavy. Okay. Because um, this is a, this is a thing that I've dealt with when in, in working with students over the years as a professor when people um, come to me for sort of a mentorship or advice or what have you all the time is trying to find your passion in life. And so it, it, in, if you set something up with an external reward such that you do it, and then if you do well enough, you get X, Y, or Z, um, you will very often, um, if that particular activity involves any form of creativity um, or ingenuity or thoughtfulness, 
um, where you have to sort of like stretch yourself a little bit in order to achieve it, to learn to do something different. If you set up um, a reward, performance will go down. Hmm. This happens like in the banking industry where they're you know trying to like get stockbrokers to um, uh, you know uh, make the most money. Like it, it's basically across fields. Hmm. And it's all covered in this book by called Drive by Daniel Pink. At least. Um, a, a large amount of the literature. It's pretty fucking incredible just how widespread this really is. So I think what happens and what has happened and one of the reasons why it was necessary to kind of write this book is that um, in the bodybuilding world, 20 years ago or even longer when I was first doing this, there was no – you didn't get any in, extrinsic reward. Like. Mm. There was no like, you know, I post a picture up and then I have a thousand and one likes and people saying, oh, my God, you look awesome or what have you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, you, and people know this intuitively anyway. People will be like, so I, the question you probably asked yourself, I know you have because we talked about it, and is if I pick something I'm passionate about and make it my, my life's work, will that I rob myself of the passion behind that endeavor? Mm, yeah. Will it not be as much fun anymore? And I think probably myself intuitively, I, I don't like. I've never been like a money um, centered person, you know. I've just I've got I've got my dogs guarding the house, you know, and they've got enough food, and I can lift weights and eat and do simple things and that keeps me happy. And I'm lucky and I'm simple in that way. But um, but I think when uh, when people and this is the nature of what social media has done to some degree is this created an extrinsic reward that's coupled to so many different things in our daily lives. Yeah. So many different activities that we partake in. Like like anything like um like I don't know if you can see all this sh all this shit behind me like I've been like um I put made like a security box for my Jeep. It was freaking awesome. It was so much fun to do. Okay. I took some wood and I have a slide to it and now I got this box and I'm and I'm putting I'm making like a little solar generator system so that I can go um, with take the dogs to the park or whatever, and like, and I have a, I'm gonna have a little fridge that will run on solar in the back of my Jeep. No kidding. So if I want to go grocery shopping in the day, I don't have to skedaddle home to get things. In. I'm gonna literally have a little fridge. No kidding. I'll, That's I'll, cool. I'll send you the picture. Of it. Yeah, it was yeah. just fun as hell to do. Like these, like Jeep lock boxes are like, you know, they're hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars for the sliding thing. Like Damn. The Overland Overlanders is kind of the term that you people want to go out with their FJ cruisers or their Jeeps or their trucks and do some overlanding where they've got a cooler and they can camp and that kind of shit. Yeah. And like equipment can go, it's just sky high. So I, I just went and, you know, I bought some, bought some wood and bought some brackets and I, I bought, actually I used like bed liner yeah. to paint the wood. Then I got some, um, diamond plate rubber matting that make it look like it's diamond plate metal, but it's just rubberized. So the dogs, can, the dogs can get up on top of the thing and it's really fun to do. So something like that, that, that was just fun. And you want to share that with people, but with bodybuilding or something like that, whatever that might the creative endeavor someone might have, if you start getting rewarded for that, like social media rewards us in a way. And I don't know, I haven't gotten to the part in Pink's book where he's talking about social media as a reward because that's sort of a social reward. It's not a monetary fixed extrinsic reward, but if we start doing things for for that extrinsic reward, we can rob ourselves of the intrinsic value of of those endeavors, like the fun of like trying to figure shit out. Yeah. So then it makes me, it made me think, I'm like, holy shit, this explains why it's such an uncommon thing now or becoming, it seems like at least a much lower percentage of bodybuilders and people that are in the fitness and physique world who really like, they want to figure out on themselves for themselves because it's not intrinsically valuable to do that because the reward they're getting is an external one. They want to get up on stage. They want to look awesome, which there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone mm -hmm. wants, to, wants to look good. Right. They're social creatures, you know. But it, it's as if that ex, that intrinsic motivation has been extinguished by social media because it's providing external rewards, which has that effect. Hmm. So then the ingenuity and the curiosity and the creativity that would normally come behind, you know, oh, how do I, do I have to use diuretics for peak week? Or like, you know, how do I, how, how do I adjust my food? Like what's, what macronutrient should I adjust first? Does it matter? Can I, is, is it should be fat or, or, or carbs? I'm confused. People are just like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm just going to hire a coach. Hmm. Because 
there's they've lost that. It's fun to figure that shit out. Mm. At least it is, is for me still, and I'm very happy about that. So I, I think I, I kind of connected, and maybe this is just maybe this is my own the babbling of a, a raving you know maniac. But um, it seems to me like one of the things this this explains this 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 phenomenon where um, people just I saw this on Professional Muscle Muscle actually a thread about where have all the OGs gone, hmm. all the original gangsters, and they were. The per- what someone was saying is that you know a question that you wouldn't have heard ten years ago, or you, or a statement you would have heard it was just hire a coach. Hmm. Yeah, like that. That was that, that's like the wh- why are you asking all these stupid questions? Just hire a coach. That was like the tough love. Hmm. You know, whereas ten years ago is like it's like well get in the gym and figure it out. You know, yeah. or change your diet for two months and figure it out. Like yeah. that was the tough love, and now the tough love is just hire a coach. Hmm. And it's still like this kind of like brash, like, you know, guys telling guys what to do, like buck up trooper, right? get in there and figure this shit out. Just go hire a coach. What's wrong with you? Like, yeah. come on. But you can see those are just polar opposites in terms of actual approaches. Yeah, absolutely. One is com- completely um, digging in and, and feeling the, um, the reward of having figured it out on your own. And sort of dancing the dance with your own physiology and nutritional changes and those sorts of things. And the other one is just give it to somebody else. So connects back to Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and all those kinds of things. But um, anyway, so yeah, that was um, that was one thing I wanted to say because it was connected with with the goals and 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 seeing value in. Um, un- disentangling those bits and pieces of why you do these things that you do. Hmm. You no, know, is it because you just want to like look good on stage? You know, and then you're done, and like, and then it's there's the, then then it's over. Like, if you don't have a coach, like, you don't know what to do anymore. You're lost. Yeah, I've seen that. I don't, I don't know if you've seen that before. I was, there's a guy I worked for many many years ago who completely kept his clients in the dark. He's as, almost as funny because he was like ahead of his time in a way. He was as, as bad as anybody I've ever seen. Really, in terms of doing oh, awful. He would just he would he just he knew it was very like it was dastardly, but it was a smart business plan where he didn't educate his clients at all. Huh. And um, this is when I lived in Texas, and he was a big guy, played for the Cowboys for a couple of years, so he had like this air of authority given, you know, his status and how he looked. Sure. And, um, and you know, I don't even know how much he knew cause he never really talked about it. He just sort of like, he just, and you've seen people who do this, like they just say, this is, this is how it is. Yeah. Just listen to me. Um, and anyway, so that, 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 that's all those things are interwoven in like this, in this interesting thing that I, that I think social media and the internet and, and where we derive our motivation from is is so important. I think it's so important to reflect back on hmm. um, because that's it's like that's like you can create your the own your own carrot. Hmm. Yeah, you can create your own your own dangling carrot in a way. It's weird. I was thinking about something last night that totally relates to this, and I didn't know where to take it. I just I made a note on my phone. And the note says, uh, do uh, kids today with social media, uh, or, uh, um, what is this? Hold on a second. Um, what has changed in the motivating factors to do bodybuilding? I, you know, I was thinking back to like when I started, it was, it was the end of the era that you came from. Um, mm-hmm. When I, I remember... I, and I should say when I started competing, that is all before that for most of my life in the gym, it was that era. But when I started competing, there was only a few handful of years before it evolved into what it is today. But but back then, you know, there was a few guys that competed in that they were fewer and further between amongst very normal people that were at the gym. And you had your average gym rats and they were guys like here in Detroit, at least you know, the suburbs, we have a lot of factory workers, stuff like that. And so most of the people that were at like what we would call a hardcore gym, like I'll take powerhouse Westland, shout out to powerhouse Westland now closed down. Anybody who went there, most of the guys there were not competitors. They trained and they took gear and they got big and they ate and they did it because they loved to, and they love, love to lift heavy weights. 
And there was Shelby you used to train every once in a while. Is that the powerhouse? And that, no, that was powerhouse okay. Highland park. That one's, that's okay. the original one in Detroit. Okay. So this okay. is, this is just like a suburban gym. Everybody worked in the factories gotcha. and stuff, but it, mm. I, the same thing could be said about any of those gyms. Really Highland park was the same way. That's mm. 15 miles down the road. Um, and, and, and people did it because they loved doing it and they loved the idea of lifting weights and challenging themselves and lifting, you know, they're, 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 they're challenging, challenging each other. You know what I mean? One guy is mm. squatting four Oh five. The next guy wants to put more on the plate, you know, that type of thing. They're, they're bench pressing, you know, <laughs> way more weight than they should. And mm. a lot of these guys didn't have great form and none of them were in really awesome shape and they weren't taking the amount of gear that people are today, but it was a, it was, they did it for, I think, I just was thinking about you know what bodybuilding was then versus what bodybuilding is today. You need to come to the powerhouse north here in in, in on uh, North Florida okay. in Tampa. Yeah, Th that's how it is. Yeah, it's still like Which that guys, today. Yeah, guys, just like they're just in there, just going bonkers. Like, just there's a crew of guys that I sometimes see in there. Like, usually after I come in, yeah. I don't want to derail your story, but no, no, there's no. like some like five of them, and they just go off. They're talking shit the whole time and having a blast. <laughs> yeah, it's just like just pushing the weight man and so they get a little sloppy with the form but they're just having a good time so yeah i so love it what's what's you know so i think that i guess that that i feel like that's a dying crowd that used to be to me what bodybuilding was and nowadays there's so much it's so different you get into fitness I, you know, you, you meet people and we all, everybody complains about it on all the podcasts about how there's people that want to get into competing before they've even gotten their gym membership. They want to start taking gear before they even started training, before they knew what nutrition is. You know, the motivation, what do you think about the, can we talk a little bit about that, about what are the differences now in these motivations? Because I feel like it ties right in with what you're saying. You know what I mean? And at the end, these are, yeah. these are motivations. I outside of yourself this is not about getting any kind of personal satisfaction this is about like you said it's about getting Extr the likes extrinsic. yeah yeah these mm -hmm. extrinsic extringent uh, uh rewards yeah the, so though i'm i'm one i'm wondering and i'm not as i'm not a social psychologist but I, i'm wondering if um like back in the day when you're talking about there weren't there weren't coaches the information wasn't wasn't there so the people that you saw um, doing bodybuilding in the way that, you know, it was kind of done in the old school fashion and sort of, you know, just trying to figure it out on your own and talk to your, your buddies and tinker around and, and do things the way I have always kind of loved to do it. Um, that's pretty much all you saw because there was only, only people who were naturally oriented towards seeking out the intrinsic rewards of an endeavor would end up becoming a bodybuilder at that time. And and now, just fast forward twenty years or what have you. Now we have coaches and we have all sorts of fitness systems promising you, you know, incredible transformations. Um, we have social media perpetuating these things. You're constantly blasted with this idea that there is an extrinsic reward to be had with relative immediacy. Like you can you can get. You can get lean and big really fast if you just buy my 16-week system or whatever it may be. Mm. So that pulls people into the fitness world that wouldn't have ever been there otherwise. Ah, I see. That, that, that just don't have – they're just not as – at least when it comes to um, fitness and bodybuilding, they, they're, they're, they're not just – they don't have a proclivity to seek out intrinsic wards related to that outcome. They wouldn't have just found they, that gym on their own and discovered it otherwise, like like what we're talking they, about. It's not it's not fun for them. I, I I like I like train. Yeah, like some of those people, like they might find intrinsic reward in gardening, or working on their car, or painting, or some form of art, or or, or some other hobby or art and craft. Yeah. Um. So and you'll see that too. You go in the gym and you'll see like clients. Um, of trainers and um, uh, like, t let's say, take someone who loves to cook, and they're like, they're a they're a wonderful chef, and and they've just they spent decades learning about how to combine spices and oils, and they're just literally almost like world class expertise level of of in, in the kitchen, yeah. and the, so there's incredible tr intrinsic reward connected with that behavior. 
and then you go to the gym. Like they don't like none of that is interested in them at all. Just get me to the fucking workout. I want to get the weight off. I want to look better and just like make it happen. Yeah. So we have we have then if you go into the bodybuilding world and in, in, in competition, we have people that are maybe like I was just sort of geared to, just to seek out the intrinsic reward in the, in the endeavor. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's people who because there is now an extrinsic reward that can be had because you do have coaches, you do have programs, you do have all these things that at least promise you that immediate extrinsic reward, you'll bring people in who engage in the endeavor with an extrinsic reward um, and maybe they never would have sought out the intrinsic reward, sort of the value in being their own coach and learning about what they're actually doing. And here's, here's where my, my – I'm glad you brought this up because it gives me a chance to delineate this in a way that I've wanted to for a while. And there's the middle ground. There's some people who just like they would naturally be their own coach. Like, why the hell would I hire somebody? I can so much more fun to figure this out on my own. That's kind of how I am. Yeah. I'm just kind of that way. And it has to do with my family of origin and my personality and blah blah blah. Um, various various things probably combined to the recipe of who I am today to make me that way. Sure. And then there's some there's some people that are kind of in between. Hmm. You know, and and so they they they're bombarded with um, coaches and people saying. Come, come to the extrinsic reward side. Yeah, and and so you know we can make you, we can give you quick fixes, we can get you there really mm. rapidly, and you know t- don't worry about figuring it out. I've got it all figured out here for you. Yeah, and and we'll give you, and you'll get those rewards. You'll you'll make those changes in your body comp really, 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 really quickly. And you won't even have to and, know why. <laughs> and you don't have to know. You don't have to know why. Right. And and beca- and because we're going to provide you with the extrinsic reward and orient you towards extrinsic reward. It actually makes the knowing why and how and the underlying mechanisms and that's involved less attractive. It's not even that interesting because you that's, don't need to know anymore. That's the that's the curious thing about this mm. book, Drive by Daniel Pink, and this idea is that when you do provide those extrinsic rewards, it extinguishes the intrinsic motivation. Hmm. Yeah. Something about providing I get it the now. extrinsic reward just sucks dry. Um, I'll tell you what that something is. The something is it used to be. That by learning those, I would tell myself, because, you know, I, I would tell myself, okay, if I can teach myself how to do these things, then I can achieve this goal. And so to me, the motivating factor to learn was to achieve the goal. And so now you don't, now, you, you know, that's, that's the something you don't need that anymore yeah. is what you're saying. He calls it, he calls it the Tom Sawyer effect. Um, I don't know if it's mm-hmm. called this in literature or not, but so there's a story from um, one of Mark Twain's books, Adventures of Tom Sawyer, where, um, Tom was uh, uh, enlisted to paint like this giant white picket fence. Yeah, you may remember this story. Like I do, um, I do. Yeah, and so he's like, "Oh gosh," you know. So he he tricks all the local boys into doing his work for him because he he tells them how awesome, how much fun, and how intrinsically rewarding <laughs> it is to paint yeah. the fence. Yeah. So they get all jazzed up to do it. Had they had they said, "Well, you know, Mrs." Smith or whoever it was who told him like you have to do this you have like this is what you got to do if you want to have dinner tonight yeah well that's no fucking fun but if he's like like look at the look at the brush strokes how you can just you how beautiful you can make each of them go around and how the how the paint just you know flows in with the grain and the wood and like it's really quite it's like really so much fun to do this Come give this a try man try that wow you are really good at that yeah that's a wow, do that again that was incredible <laughs> did you see what he just did come here could you do this and, and and the next thing you know, it's the funnest thing ever. It's like going to the amusement park, painting the. So that's the Tom Sawyer effect. Hmm. Yeah. But but if you have a coach that's wanting to keep you in the dark, the saying, "Don't worry about that," or maybe he doesn't even fucking know, you know, or he just wants to give you more drugs because hmm. that basically, you know, will that'll cover up a lot of ignorance, sure, or dietary and training habits. Unfortunately, it, it does. Um, then. Once you have that extrinsic reward put in place, that's that's the ca- the the carrot dangled by those coaches or by social media with getting all the likes and all the you know the googly eyed emojis and everything else when you post up a picture. Now you've extinguished the fun of having figured out how to create those transformations in your own body. Yeah. You're not it doesn't you're not you're not motivated to like figure that out anymore. All you want is the extrinsic reward. Yeah. And so that so that's the, that's the thing that um that was in between people who who can be motivated both intrinsically and extrinsically hmm. who could go to kind of the dark side of like you know wanting to just like buy every program and get the quick fixes and 
the yeah. magic bullets and those sorts of things. But also kind of like I'm kind of interested in some of this sort of stuff. Hmm. And that leads me back to the, the personal bodybuilding inventory is – and my whole book was just to give people an option. It's like, you know what? There's a tremendous intrinsic reward that can be had here. Sure. And let me show you how much fun it can be to paint this white fence on your own. <laughs> right. Yeah, the Tom Sawyer yeah. effect, so to speak. So it's like you're kind of confused. You're looking for new and things. Like someone has that strange – like they're asking about HMB or whatever it may be. And you're like, so what are we trying to do here? Where are we going? Like – Bring them back to the personal body building inventory. They can reassess what's going on inside of themselves and say, ah, this is why I'm really doing this. Yeah. This is my intrinsic reward system. This is what this is all about. Or maybe they can at least delineate. It's like, okay, I'm vain. I want to look good in a dress or mm -hmm. in a dress shirt or whatever it may be. Um, so that's part of it. But I also really like to figure out this stuff. I like to figure out, you know, how – whether I need to start doing high reps for these muscle groups or low reps for these muscle groups or whatever it may be, whatever the, whatever the, un, the mystery they want to unravel when it comes to training, nutrition, supplementation, what have you. Yeah. Maybe it's a combination. So that the book is there to sort of um, let people know, like, there's some intrinsic reward you might be missing out on and no I, one's telling you about. I'll so. tell you what. I think I might be a middle ground guy or I, I don't know because – A lot of people are somewhere. Here's, you know? here's the way I feel is that by – now, I taught myself a lot. And then when I used a coach that, uh, I learned a lot more. Now I didn't, I didn't go to a guy who was just like, just shut up and listen. You know, I, I learned along They're out there. Yeah. And, and, and even if, even if he didn't explain stuff to me, just going through the process, I learned from it. You know what I mean? Like I learned how far I could push my body. I learned how far, you know, and, and so somebody else and helped me to fast track some information that may have taken me a longer period. So I used a coach and I have, you know, I'll even use, you know, um, the last season I competed. It's been two seasons now. That was 2017. I hired Shelby to help me for the sec. I did three shows. He helped me for the last three weeks of, uh, of the second prep, the second contest. And I remember this. Yeah. He helped me by showing me how hard I could push in my nutrition. And once I had that, then I went on, I took the, I took the reins back and it's like, now I learned something from him and I applied that to the, to the, to the, to the, to the following show after he and I worked together on my own. I, I definitely still have to thank him because he gave me the information, you know, to, to help teach me to get to where I got then. So it's uh, it was still a learning tool. So I, I don't know if that makes me an on the fence guy or if, if that's something different. We all learn from everyone. No one's figuring this shit out in a vacuum. Yeah. Like I didn't. You yeah. know, I went and just, I would just scour the boards and the internet and the scientific literature and piece together the information any way I can yeah. from whomever, you know. And I, I, re I refer to Dante because he and I have had inter interactions, you know. And, and I was sort of, it was funny because I was like onto the same number of thoughts that Dante was when I, when I found DC training. Yeah. I've said before, I was like, I was doing like, I don't know, 80% DC training already. Really? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was just sort of the same split and everything else. It was like, this is what was working for me. Um, so we kind of had parallel learning paths. But but you, you pick together. That's how you learn. You go to like gurus. You learn from them. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, they say that he was a, tra Shelby was a trail guide for you. And I call the book, it's like a, it's like a map. Yeah. You know, and it, it gives you some like, here's the terrain. Here's some possibilities. You're still going to have to figure it out on your own, you know. And he said, "Okay, let's 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 cut your calories harder than you thought you, you probably could to get away with." Yeah, and, and it worked. Yeah. So now you know that, you know, and you wouldn't have gone down like it if you, if you tried this path. You're like, "That's a fucking scary ass path." He's like, "Let's give it a go." <laughs> I think you'd be okay, I've been down there before. Yeah, yeah, you know. And so you did it. And that's a perfect way to learn. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We all have to learn from somebody, you know. I mean, sometimes you could just like. There are people who just like are off the wall and they'll just like they're complete innovators. Like you can, and this is like a business, but you can look like there's a, there's people that are in, innovate, people that are, are followers, and there's kind of various ways you can categorize people in terms of of how uh, novel innovations come into the business world or technology or what have you. And there are people that are just creating new and novel shit all the time. Yeah, you know, just coming up with stuff and thinking outside the box, so to speak. Um, uh, I actually said once recently like, there is no box hmm. that's the, that's the way to look at it. there's no box um what, what box are you talking about yeah but so 
some not everyone's like that. You have to learn from somebody, so you're paying attention to those people who are off the beaten trail. Like, so oh yeah, look what that guy's doing. Holy sh! Look, he's got some. Those are pretty cool little spikes he's got in his feet. They're letting him like run up the side of that mountain where I don't think anyone ah. could run otherwise. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. I think I can probably come up with something like that. Yeah. You know, I can use these things. So you so you you innovate your own ideas based on what you saw him do. So. Shelby told you about a different path you could take, and that's that's the perfect use of a coach. It's yeah. when people are, are are like, and this is this is what I uh, this is one of the re- rewards that's even a bigger piece than just the sort of the immediate intrinsic reward of having kind of um, figured things out mm. is that then you become a little more brazen, and maybe if if athletic endeavors or bodybuilding have a greater purpose to carry over in a more global way the rest of our lives hmm. so now you're like you know what i don't i don't have to follow like the you know don't go below 10 calories per pound per day rule hmm. i can do whatever it's like you know i don't have to follow the rule of thumb for po- for podcasting i can do it this way hmm. yeah. i can do something that's even more off the beaten path so you learn from the microcosm of bodybuilding yeah. um, a certain amount of confidence in yourself and your own you learn to be your own bodybuilding coach. You learn to be your own Buddha. You learn to be your own podcasting guru or what have you. Yeah. And you start doing it on your own. And that's what I, I hate to see is when people, they'll take on a coach as a set of training wheels that they never dump off. Mm. Yeah. So they just keep on like, so they're dieting down again and they're in that same situation. And it's like, okay, we know exactly what worked. We're going to have to cut your calories really freaking low. And they're like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, it just worked. Like yeah. we did this before. Like I don't see. Then maybe it won't work. You never know. But it's everything else is lined up exactly like it, it had before, and they they don't they haven't built up a certain amount of confidence. Yeah, they haven't gained a little maturity or insight or wisdom or however you want to kind of couch it in a way that that makes them um, sort of behave uh, makes it makes their life better and makes their ability to explore all that life has to give us. Um, much more enjoyable. Yeah. Just in general, like, fuck it, I'm going to go below 10 calories per pound. Fuck it, I'm going to do something new and different with my podcast that no one's ever done before. Let's see what or happens. whatever. Yeah, and see what happens. And and that's that's the thing that I think about because bodybuilding is such an extreme endeavor and I think you can you can learn so much because it is an extreme confidence tester in so many ways because it's your own mm. body. Mm-hmm. And people can get get um become like it can be right in your face like oh my gosh i am totally paralyzed about whether i should drop carbs or fat Mm. holy shit what do i do what do i do what do i do it's like it's like you're about like to make a decision that's gonna you know bring the world and the humanity to a screeching halt (laughs) yeah you know or you're gonna save everyone you know and and you'll be the you know the world's greatest savior (laughs) um and when you don't, when you can't step back from the crunch time of bodybuilding and get some perspective from those moments, then I think you've lost out mm. on an important insight that this that this endeavor can get you. Mm. As you can step back in so many ways, say, okay, this is all first world problems. You know, gosh, I really am insecure about my body. I do mm. have some esteem issues. Now they're right in my face, um, and these are impacting how I deal with my husband, how I deal with my wife, how I deal with my friends. So many different things. Like, there's so many lessons that can be extrapolated from the being in the pressure cooker of bodybuilding that only come from having to think for yourself a little bit. Yeah. Stretch yourself. Step outside the box for a little while. Get off the beaten path. That that I, I think are just wonderful things for for people to to have to sort of broaden their perspectives in life. And that's what I want for everyone is to have a better life. You know. So that's why the why the book is there. It's like, yeah. Step off the path. Maybe you'll get something that might make the rest of your life better too. Yeah, I like that, so, man. I think that's yeah. a it's a nice explanation, and it's uh, very nicely said. Um, a little while ago, while we were talking, uh, Richard Martindale chimed in, and he said, "Hey, huh. Scott Stevenson." Wait. He says, "I was there with him freshman year doing cybergenics with our group. Leg day was always killer with Scott involved." Uh, <laughs> so that is uh, Richard David Martindale, a fraternity brother of mine, one of my best friends from college. You okay? He's a lawyer. His um, you remember the the um, 
game show Tic Tac Doe? Yes, yes. Well, I don't. I mean, I've seen it like repeats yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, the 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 host for that was Wink Martindale. Okay, that's Rich's uncle. Oh, no kidding. So we used to call him when he when he, he played uh, football in high school and he gained a little you know the freshman fifteen. Mm-hmm. So instead of calling him Wink, we called him Twink, as in Twinkie. So we call him <laughs> we call him Twink sometimes. That's funny. Or Rich, yeah, he's from um, uh, from Tennessee. Okay. And uh, I remember like I was there my freshman year and he said this to me. Um, I, I stepped into his dorm dorm room and I was kind of standing there in the threshold of the door. The threshold, I yeah, in, yeah, I was <laughs> in the threshold. And I'm halfway in and halfway out, and he's like, my nickname in college was Rowdy. He's like, um, he's like, watch out, Rowdy. I'm fixing to put the door to. And I'm like, hold on, what? He's like, watch out, I'm fixing to put the door to. I'm like, what's wrong with the door? And where are you putting it? Mm-hmm. Well, fixing to, like, I'm fi- I'm about to do that and put the door to. He's closed the door. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I like I'd never heard that before. So I remember that was one of the things. Like, oh, okay, now I'm in the South. Yeah, fixing yeah. to put the door to. Yeah, yeah. Rich said that to me. That's so, funny. Anyway, that's hilarious. He chimed in. Yeah. yeah, cybergenics. Still the hardest program I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I've talked about that before, but that's a whole other topic. I think so. And we're uh, we're out about. Excuse me. I can't even talk now. We're about out of time here. Uh, no. But this is a lot of fun, Scott. Guys, once again, uh, iTunes is down at the moment, so we're going to have this show up as usual. It'll be up at YouTube, of course. iTunes is up. Advices Radio is down, right? Uh, iTunes is down. No, because iTunes is connected to advicesradio.com. That's where all the shows are. So iTunes is not down. Let's our iTunes. About iTunes. Our iTunes. No, our yeah, yeah, our time our iTunes is down. Okay. You're messing with me today. I know I am. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> right. So you guys can go to YouTube, you can check out all the shows there. And uh if we can't get this thing back up and running, I'm just gonna have to start up a new account. We'll we'll uh we'll start everything uh, fresh, you know, no. worst case scenario. But we'll uh yeah. Hopefully we'll get advicesradio.com back up and running. Otherwise, you guys can still check out all the shows here. Go to the Advices Radio Facebook page. Go to the Advices Radio YouTube page. And uh, Dr. Scott, as always, man, it's been a pleasure. This was fun. No questions answered. Just pure banter. A lot of, lot of questions answered for myself, though, inside of my own head. <laughs> Megan, I'm, I'm ready to go train now. I'm going to go eat some awesome. food. I'm going to go get a workout in. How yeah, about you? No what do you got going on? You. No golf. No golf. Uh, I got lots of work to do. All right. It's going to be a fun week. Yeah. Well, I will let you get to it. And, uh, and I'll look forward to talking to you in another couple days uh, for the Swoley Trinity. Yeah. Here we go. Number four. Five. Thanks, right? five. 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 Yes, sir. Yeah. Number five. All right. Let's go. All right, guys. See you guys. Two days later. For another episode of Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott. I'm Scott McNally. We'll see you soon. Adios.